good morning and uh, appreciate such a nice crowd and uh, we really appreciate the interest in the CDCB and when uh, Dr. Durr was uh, presenting and, and uh, talking uh, about the beginnings it this is a great success story for our industry and and I think without buy-in all the sectors everyone has bought in so far and I think that's the real key to the, our success and uh, so our our panel this morning uh, uh, we, we have a, a superstar lineup here that I hope I can get them engaged to talk and I won't have to say much but I want to make a little bit of an inter introduction to our topic. My name is Neil Smith. I'm with American Jersey Cattle Association and I currently serve on the Council Board of Directors uh, representing the colored breeds for PDCA. Our topic, um, undesirable genetic factors and genomics role in discovery, um, you know, we, we may refer to this as genetic conditions. Uh, there's a lot of terminology to be used and you'll hear several, I'm sure, this morning. But I wanna talk a little bit about the the steps in the process that are, that are necessary. Uh, of course, we have to have discovery and that requires reporting. And when we get ready to close, the last line you're gonna hear from me is, please address reporting, however you're involved, to the producer level. And we're gonna to try to take care of that uh, informatively, but reporting is the key to discovery of a, any genetic condition or undesirable genetic factor. Then we have an, the, the investigation step. We, gotta, we have to verify, and then we want to identify. Now that requires testing, genomic testing. This is probably the most powerful tool in, in my lifetime for the dairy industry. Uh, we have tremendous potential for future discovery and management. Then we have, we, then, then our industry requires or needs labeling, full transparency. I feel that our industry has bought in the NAB, all the AI companies are on board. They test and label all the bulls. Your breed associations are doing a great job with that. And then our breeders have to manage it. And they, we, if we don't follow those steps successfully, they can't really uh, effectively manage. So we're gonna try to talk about that some today too. So to our panel, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Paul Van Raden uh, as the first member of our panel and uh, ask Paul to uh, give us a little introduction about himself and address how our haplotype calls developed. All right, uh, thank you very much, Neil. Uh, Paul Van Raden, I've been working at USDA in Beltsville, Maryland since 1988. And uh, so first you may want to know exactly what a haplotype is, which is basically just a short segment of uh, DNA on one chromosome and when you send the DNA to a lab they <coughs> you get a genotype which measures the combined DNA that the calf has from both the sire and the dam two copies of the chromosomes then we have to split that out statistically into the the paternal chromosome and the maternal chromosome. And the haplotypes we're going to talk about right now are mainly ones where if the sire and the dam provide the same stretch of DNA that has a defect in it, then that can lead to the embryo being lost or the calf being born with defects that are 
you know, fairly consequential or, or that they die immediately after birth. <coughs> and the way we got started in these was actually a, a project of Katie Olson when she was a uh, postdoc in our lab. And uh, there was a new genetic defect, Brachy spina, mm -hmm. that was uh, discovered in Europe and NAB wanted us to determine is it the same, you know, inherit, can we duplicate or find the same inheritance here? And that worked very well using a haplotype in that particular segment. And then the next day we decided to look at all the chromosomes, all the haplotypes to see if we could use the same technique to find additional mm -hmm. uh, segments that are when they're inherited, the uh, embryo is lost. And that's how we got our start. And uh, then the next step is to try to find what exact uh, point mutation within that haplotype is causing the trouble. And then we can uh, provide that to the laboratories so that they can develop gene tests to more accurately uh, track the problem. Okay, thank you, Paul. So, I'm trying to do this respectfully here, so I got to get Dr. George Wiggins next. Uh, we kind of brought him out of retirement this morning. So, George, uh, give us a little introduction of, about yourself and your involvement, um, and then how has the discovery and understanding of genetic conditions changed with genomics? Well, thank you. Uh, I've been fortunate to work with Paul during uh, his career. I actually started with USDA in, in 78. And I'd just like to build a little bit on what Paul was saying, is that uh, these haplotypes, when there was del deleterious or causing a uh, uh, loss of genotype, we actually looked at that in terms of uh, loss in fertility. So that was kind of the key that we looked to say, uh, when, when is it that we don't find the same haplotype coming from both parents in a live animal? And then similarly, we can look at the fertility to see if uh, there was a depression in fertility from the quotes carrier. So that's really the, the kind of the goal of this is to identify animals that uh, appear to have this segment or this haplotype piece of DNA that uh, does cause this reduction in fertility. So that's why instead of saying, oh, lethal, ge lethal genotype or lethal defect, we, taught, we call them haplotypes affecting fertility. So this has given the industry the opportunity to reduce the frequency of these haplotypes by being uh, alerted to them through the, the role of genomics. And it just sort of shows that the original emphasis on genomics to uh, have early accurate uh, predictions of genomic value also has had many other benefits of, uh, of which this is one. Okay, thank you. So I'd like to uh, introduce Dr. Matt McClure, uh, who is with ABS Global. And Matt, would you uh, uh, give us a little bit of information about your role uh, with ABS and the industry and related to this uh, topic and then what has been the historical strategy of the AI industry when un undesirable genetic conditions are discovered. So I'm the lead geneticist at ABS Global um, here in Madison and first I wanted to recognize that the AI industry and ABS take genetic defects extremely seriously. You know, we, we test all of our breeding animals for known genetic defects. We report that. So all of our animals, either through CDCB or our own publications, once we know their defect status, we report that. We don't hide any of this information. We also realize though, no animal is perfect. Every animal has multiple genetic defects in it. So do we, all of us have them. Most of them are just unknown, they're too rare, so we can't select for them. But once we know the animal's genetic defects, we use that in our mating systems 
to help decrease the risk of genetic defects while maximizing genetic potential. Just because an animal carries a defect does not exclude it from our breeding program. We look, at, yep, we look at the severity of the defect, we look at the frequency of that, and its genetic potential, and decide how to use the animal. We also, you know, historically the ag industry you know, is very supportive of research into it. And we support CDCB, we support the academic researchers. Um, recently, ABS, we donated sequence data to Chad the cow, which he used to help find the cause of allele for muscle weakness. We also had the USDA found the cause of allele for Jersey neurolog Neurological and Spread Legs, or JNS. Yeah, JNS. But there wasn't a diagnostic test for it yet. So ABS took the initiative, developed a diagnostic test so we could test our own animals, and then we publicly released it. We had a preprint publication so the rest of the industry could use that. People like JR could then develop an in-house test for it and offer that commercially so that everyone else can start selecting their animals and making their decisions to reduce the genetic risk while maximizing the profit. Excellent explanation, Matt. Thank you, and you just reminded me uh, when I said we, we need uh, industry reporting. I appreciate your comments on the position ABS, and I think all of our AI companies uh, similar position. Everyone is reporting, but we also want to address at the end of this session, reporting at the farm level on something unusual. That, that, that also is extremely important. So we need labeling and we need industry cooperation. And you just gave an excellent example of the cooperation by ABS with, with the industry to help us further investigate and develop, uh, identify and develop testing protocols. So, Let's, let's get, uh, I got to get my, uh, I just know Rich Tate as JR. So I'm just going to introduce him as JR with Neogen. And would you uh, give us a little introduction, JR, of your, your uh, involvement and then how has chip density impacted the topic? Thank you, Neil. Um, I am, have been involved mostly with uh, beef cattle breeding and genetics history. I'm trained as a quantitative geneticist. I worked at a university. I worked for the USDA government for a while, and I've been at Neogen for about six years, seven years now. And I'm in charge of our R&D department where we develop the new genotyping platforms as well as interpretations for customers to use the information for breeding and selection purposes. Um, and relative to the uh, densities and things like that, we've been very blessed at Neogen to be able to offer a wide portfolio of different gene seq genomic profilers of different density. And for relatively small incremental increases in cost, we can deliver like uh, 100K to some entities or the 65K that we use for our nominations to the CDCB relative to what those were in the history of the his, uh, previous platform of a 9,000 SNP density, it increases the resolution of what people like the USDA can look at, you know, roughly 10 to 15 times. So it gives them more opportunity. Um, normally the process includes uh, imputation to go from the 9K up to the evaluation data set. But if you have the actual genotypes called, you don't rely on the risk of the imputation giving incorrect information, you have the actual content. And that's very beneficial for the resolution of these investigations. Thank you, JR. We have one more uh, important member of our panel, Mr. Spencer Hackett, who represents our producer. Uh, he's the lone uh, active producer on uh, our panel and uh, he's with uh, Malari Farms. And I'm gonna ask Spencer to give us a little bit of uh, more information about himself. And would you address, uh, as a breeder, how do you manage genetic selection around carriers of uh, haplotypes and undesirable conditions? Well, thank you. 
Um, a little bit about myself. Uh, I come from central Minnesota, just north of St. Cloud. Um, we farm there with uh, my two sons. We milk 150 cows. We farm 1,000 acres. Um, genomics basically kind of discovered us when it first came out in 2007. We had cows that maybe didn't deviate high enough on the other system. Had a couple AI companies that wanted to test some early progeny there. You know, they were always kind of on the bubble of families and we actually found some stuff in our herd to work with and go from there. Uh, my grandfather always said, keep working with the best you got. Don't force it to the top, let it come to the top. What I've learned with the carrier part of it, um, unfortunately, I like to say that I probably work with as many carriers as anybody. I do not shy away from them. I just learn how to manage them because some of those families seem to have a lot of other really um, desirable traits we like to bring to the breed or try to bring to the breed and go forward with. I think some of the progress in getting these animals identified early um, as carriers or whatever has helped us as producers not line them up one on top of the other, sire on dam, which ends up leading to a higher rate of abortions and everything else. And I think having this information available to us has really helped us along with fertility and health trait selections. And by using some of this information on the haplotypes and everything has helped us as producers be able to identify these, not make those alignments where they're both on each side, resulting in a higher percentage of casualties or abortions as we're going. So I feel as a producer, we're on the forefront out there for information. I think it's very important for us to collect data as we see it. I uh, made a very wise de decision 37 years ago and married a very, very good calf feeder, as most of, most of us seem to do. And she can identify some of these haplotypes just by sometimes the calves are struggling a little bit before we even get the test results back. I'll tell you she's about 100% accurate, even if she's not. I'm still going to tell you that. <laughs> but. Uh, by knowing some of this information and being a producer out there in the field, I think it gives us a great opportunity when we see some of this stuff that even if it hasn't been identified yet, it's so easy nowadays to grab a sample, write it down, the next thing you see a common denominator of two or three of the same crosses or the same sire or the same dam and maybe there's gonna be a way down the road to research and do some study and then make new discoveries going forward that we haven't discovered or uncovered yet. Thank you, Spencer. Good explanation. So, um, one of our industry frustrations, I guess, uh, at least has been for Jersey staff and our board, uh, when we had, uh, and I'll just use JNS as an example, uh, the first affected calf was discovered several years before we got down to the nuts and bolts. And that's very unfortunate. So, one of, one of I mentioned earlier, reporting at the, the farm level is so, so very important. So, Spencer, when your wife, the genius on your farm, discovers something unusual, what do you do? Do you report it? Um, yes, I can take this way back. Um, we had a we had a mating that actually resulted in 15 calves, of which seven of them were born deformed and dead, and of course they were all heifer calves. And back this was prior to 2007, um, prior to genomic testing and everything. We went as far as sending one of those calves in because it was a very common denominator that we saw. We sent it to what we were advised to at that time was to a university in Iowa. And just for them to you know, do research and studying on it and try to find what was the common denominator in that mating or whatsoever. Um, fast forward, it would be so much easier today to grab a hair sample or a tissue sample and maybe collaborate two or three things that maybe we see in Minnesota 
and now somebody in Texas might be seeing it and somebody in another country might be seeing it. Um, I know I've brought it up in discussions that we have on some of these committees. You know, maybe some of these samples could be sent in and labeled as research. You know, just to start to compile some of that data of what we're looking for to try to get in front of this so-called undesirable trait before it becomes an impact on making the most productive animal out there for our dairy producers. So when I, when I, uh, my expression about frustration we experienced, uh, you know, we even had a couple board members or former directors who, you know, when, once we started describing this condition, you know, they would, they would say, you know, I think we had a calf like that last year. But it was a bull calf, so we just euthanized it. And so, you know, that's, that's the kind of situation. Maybe innocent, but we can't work with it if we don't uh, learn about it. And uh, Matt, you uh, had played quite an important role in that JNS discovery, and, and there's other stories. But I mean, do you have any examples of particular case study on something that you'd like to share? Well, to start with, so I didn't marry a good calf eater, but I did marry a, a very smart woman. I, I, I do support you know, the idea of a uh, way to national airport. So my wife and I lived in Ireland for a couple of years, and she helped set up for the Irish Cattle Breeding Federation a national defect reporting center. So any farmer could report in, I got this weird calf, and we'll send a sample out. And once it gets going, you get some interesting cases. Sure. Um, so, you know, I've, I've worked on JNS, Weaver syndrome. Um, <clears throat> yeah, <clears throat> you get some weird ones thrown up. So I, I actually worked on JNS as a postdoc. We thought it was limber like, you know, and then. Right. Uh, yeah. At Jersey, we were pretty suspicious it was just more limber leg, but it's not. Yeah. And, and we started talking to people and said, well, it looks a little, <clears throat> a little different. <laughs> um, so you know my experience <clears throat> sorry my experience is just you know have the farmers report it you know and try to have you know that linkage you know anything what's going unusual here. anything Please unusual report. you know it you know sometimes it's not a genetic defect and that's fine we'll work oh. with the vets to realize hey this is actually a parasite but report it you know report it to your vet to your AI industry to your herd books you know, if you report it to ABS, we keep a record of this, and then we have a couple vets and academic researchers we work with. Report it to someone. You know, we, we won't think you're a bad producer. We know these are out there. But if it's not reported to us, to, to anyone, we can't help you. Yeah, we, we don't want to treat these genetics like they have the plague either. I, I, that, I think uh, historically in, in this, subject topic, you know, we, we used uh, pretty much uh, for several decades, it was recessive traits, and uh, that's kind of the way back history, but because we didn't have the tools we have today, uh, there, was, there was a lot more exclusion and people just, the best way to make sure they didn't make that mistake was eliminate those genetics from their, from their gene pool going forward. We don't have to do that now. If, if we can still take advantage of good genetics and we have the tools to manage it. So the next, uh, JR, the next step I wanted to cover, we've talked about haplotype testing and then uh, direct testing has been developed in a, in a lot of conditions. And so would you, would you give us a difference, a little, expand on the difference between uh, haplotype testing and reading and, and a, a, direct, a direct test? So we definitely rely on a lot of partners in this space to help us understand what has been discovered from a haplotype perspective and then what seems to be the putative causative mutation. And then we often do develop a direct test to be able to enable that kind of information. And a lot of times there is some uh, biology or some un understanding that this makes sense for the phenotype that's been observed as to this is the reason this could be or should be the causative mutation. Getting lots of animals genotyped with the direct test is a very strong way to understand that and manage it even more explicitly. And I think one part of that is 
Um, there is a possibility, theoretically, that some haplotypes that weren't identified as the haplotype might possibly carry the direct genetic mutation and might be missed that way. Um, and other times the mutation could be early, you know, not time out with the time, the ha timing of the haplotype uh, designation. So there's a bit of nuance into this in terms of the difference, but the direct gene test is a powerful tool to help with that management of the matings and get a more uh, definitive kind of concept around what is this animal's status in life and how to use it in an effective breeding program. And the whole goal is to in, in increase productivity and efficiency of the production system with things that aren't part of the productivity, the, the production traits or the health traits or some of those kinds of things. What are some other things to manage and improve fertility and efficiency of breedings and getting cows bred so that they can get into the milking strength? Excellent. We're going to get into the discovery discussion for the future here in a minute. I got another follow-up question on on uh, the same topic. Paul, what happens when the direct test disagrees with the haplotype? Paul. <laughs> uh, well, we generally recommend that the gene test is more accurate. The haplotype tests are usually in the you know 90 some percent accurate, but the gene test can be 99.9% .9 accurate. They're not always that way. And we've, you know, so there is, there is still the possibility when, when you're developing new chips that the, that the reading, especially for some of these complex uh, mutations such as uh, insertions or deletions, they're not just, mo most of the things we've discovered, the SNPs are just one letter difference, A, C, G, T. Those are easy to read. Uh, but we're starting to find more and more now the more complex where there's DNA missing or extra DNA. And those can disrupt the gene, but they're not always as easy to, uh, to set up the gene test for. Uh, the reason why the haplotypes can be wrong, a lot of times, is because we're requiring like a hundred SNPs in a row to, de to define the haplotype. And if there are missed, just one or two uh, of those SNPs nearby are wrong, that can, that can uh, indicate a different haplotype. And so within like sometimes the whole family, you're getting a, uh, a blockage of the transmission of the haplotype from the ancestor to the descendants. Uh, and what's really become more complex for some of them is when we trace the haplotypes accurately, but there's two different versions of the haplotype. And this has happened with the muscle weakness, uh, with the cholesterol deficiency, and before that even with the CVM, the congenital vertebral malformation, and even with... I'm not going to repeat that. <laughs> <laughs> and even with the uh, dominant red, because two animals may have inherited exactly the same, not exactly, they have inherited the same haplotype from ancestors, but during the, one of the generations, there was a mutation which causes the defect. And so some of the families have the, the normal version, other ones have the defective version, and that's the case where gene tests are much more accurate than haplotype tests. Excellent. Anyone else want to add anything to that? That's, that's pretty deep for me, but I appreciate the good explanation. Any, any other? So, okay. Um, Katie, how are we doing on time? My clock says we're good, so. Okay. We haven't touched on uh, a couple other things, and, and uh, I think we've covered reporting the conditions pretty well. And you were getting into how we deal with uh, the, the, where the development of the direct test has 
gotten to so far. What's JR, if you wanna you wanna take this question? Future development of these tools. Where where are we get where can we take this, I guess, is the I, I think in part, Neil, one part of this is we're starting to see instead of the preliminary information on the haplotypes of they just were never seen in the homozygous state, now that we're getting millions and millions of animals genomically tested and available, we're able to also identify uh, frequencies that aren't as high as expected. So it isn't an absolute lethality, it is some sort of reduced uh, effectiveness or functionality or something like that. So I think there's a little bit of more opportunity to identify deviations from Hardy Weinberg expectations and investigate and understand that way. Certainly, as we continue to move forward, there will be more sequencing opportunities and different ways potentially to capture the genotypes that go into the evaluations. And there could be extra content available and delivered to key individuals, uh, entities that would leverage that and have it sitting in their database to understand and investigate to some degree on what that looks like. We're still working through some of the um, process and opportunity to get those tools readily adapted and available into the industry. But you know, we're excited for what the future of that looks like. And it's the challenge is what is something that we can get collected and have sitting there so people can make more effective decisions in a timely manner instead of potentially having to wait for a direct gene test to be developed. We've got. Um, new platforms that we're in the process of working on that may give insights um, from a functional um, curated database standpoint and that these are potentially highly functional mutations that may be of interest in the future. What is the interest and in the effect of that has to be determined to some degree, but there could be a very strong tie between these reports of individual animals and what attributes do they contain that we can capture at the same time that we do the um, primary genomic selection tools for breeding purposes. Thank you, excellent. Anybody else wanna expand on that, Matt? I, I was just gonna say what Jared, as you're talking, I expect you to go into muscle weakness. That's a great case to where just because an animal is homozygous for it, you know, we call it, it's not fully penetrant. So just because they have both alleles, they don't show it. You know, it's, it's a different type of genetic defect. So it's a new way we need to think about them and how to manage it. So you could have a calf that is almost like a sport. It's perfectly fine. Or, hey, it has trouble a couple of days of, of getting up. Some like us in the morning. We're not as agile in the morning. We need a little help, a little coffee. But then they recover and they're fine. And then the vast majority of them do have issues. So we're finding these new genetic defects that require a, a slightly different way to think about them. But we just need to recognize it that, yep, it's a defect. We need to manage it. So it sounds like uh, chip uh, development is part of the part of the future too. It, it seems like I remember maybe a 3K chip in the beginning and, and that has progressed tremendous variety of, of different SNPs available on a variety of chips. Uh, Definitely. Um, and we're sometimes, you know, Paul brought up a very important part for what is happening here, that it's not just the single AGTC changes that are causing these. Sometimes it is an insertion or a deletion or things like that. As we get an opportunity to look across a lot of different species that we support um, at Neogen, a lot of mutations that cause adverse attributes in animals or sometimes favorable coat color, things like that kind of attributes, they are more complex kinds of mutations and take a different design, a different genetic testing platform, some things like that. So there's some give and take in that space. And I have started to think about this, that the inherent genetic machinery within the cells, sometimes if that is a challenging process for us to develop a genetic test for, that's because the genetic machinery within the cells had challenging attributes to get that replicated and generated throughout the, the process of meiosis and things like that. So 
there's a certain amount of recognition that Mother Nature, where she has challenges, maybe we will have challenges as a genetic testing development platform and how robust and how effective can some of those be. So those are challenges that my team continues to work through as well. Excellent. Now, I want to go back to uh, the Holstein muscle weakness. Um, a point we wanted to make, I think I was supposed to mention to the audience that you can submit questions via Slido, and I forgot to mention that in the beginning, and I think they have directions how to do that on the screen. So we would welcome questions uh, if submitted through Slido. But the point of still am under investigation, I want to mention and, and remind our producers and breeders, sometimes we do have to be patient with these to, because we have to be absolutely certain that we're 99.9% .9 sure we have it identified correctly because misinformation, bad information just causes more problems down the road. Spencer, you want to? Yes, I wanted to comment a little bit on that. You know, as a producer out there, uh, I'm fortunate enough I get to serve on the GAC committee. Um, I'm involved on this side of it a little bit as well. This muscle weakness thing, uh, we, we're all on it at basically the same first page of the book, so to speak. Um, the, these guys back here behind reading the chips and trying to line up the stuff and everything, they haven't had a whole lot of time ahead of us, you know, for this coming out to the producers and everything. It's probably one question that my phone will my phone will ring or I'll get a text on, you know, what's taking so long? You know, why, why isn't it more available? What, what's going on? Why doesn't someone so carry the test? Um, this thing got brought to the forefront extremely fast. So we're, we're not trying to slow things down or anything. We're trying to be 99.9% .9 accurate with that information when it's coming out to us as producers to make decisions and go forward with it. You know, um, I think all AI organizations, uh, they're, they're jumping all over it because us as producers, as customers, we're, we're looking for it. We wanna, we wanna eliminate it. We've seen some of these conditions out there and, and yes, there are some awful good programs that can keep these calves alive. And when we see a homozygous one, it's in my opinion, it's evident there's more than just my wife that can feed calves. But saying that, we're gonna have to give us a little bit of time or give some uh, CDCB and these guys that are working on it to get this test extremely accurate. We're using the information they're giving, it, giving to us now but as an organization or anybody, we don't want to print something until we're sure of what we're printing is accurate, just for making sure what we're doing is the most accurate information out there. That's excellent. And Katie, I think, has a question, but let me ask uh, George one more, and then we'll, we'll go to Katie with, with an audience question. George, you pioneered through just about all of this process. You've, you've been part of the 3K, the 6K, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and, and the development to where we are now. Words of wisdom. What, what, well, 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 thank yeah, you, Neil. First of all, we can't assume where Spencer's talking here. We, we cannot assume we have a case if we don't test that animal. But uh, that's, that's my side point, but I'd, I'd like to hear your, your thoughts on uh, future development as well. So since it's my thoughts, of course, I'm free to say anything I want. Absolutely. So, so uh, I will make a plug for uh, the technology that gives us a chance to do full sequencing because ultimately that's where we get all the information and can pick out of that what uh, is most useful. And on that front, the, the sort of the next generation of uh, genotyping probably will be sequence based because it has the potential of uh, efficiencies but you know it's, it's something we've been talking about for a couple of years now so I, I don't want to give you a prediction of when it's going to happen but uh, Neil mentioned the progression so it's all a, a case of cost benefit that uh, with the 3K it was a tremendously important because it brought genotyping to the females 
before the studs could afford to genotype their males and could have the benefit of the reduced generation interval and the early marketing of high, more accurate evaluations on young bulls. But then with the 3K, we could uh, go to cows. Then as JR was saying, we've made tremendous uh, strides in being able to increase the density, which uh, gives us more accuracy. We, we talk about, the, in, in all of this, we know that the uh, measures are, are very good, but they're not perfect. So even in this issue of uh, haplotype matching, if there's a uh, error in the call, which even at 99.9% .9 accuracy, there will be some. So the, the, the technology is really breathtaking as to how it's been able to give us more information at lower cost. Perfect. And uh, I would add, I've been amazed uh, at the growth of the genomic database. You know, obviously Holstein has the larger, by far the largest database, but the other breeds are very rapidly accumulating and building a stronger genomic tested database. Katie, what's your question? All right, we have a handful coming in. So we're going to start with, this one is for Paul. For optimal genetic progress, should we label a defect or include the defect's economical impact in an overall economic index? Uh, that's a very good question. I was going to bring that up if somebody didn't. Uh, our, our genomic predictions right now <coughs> are additive genetic merit. So they're assuming that one copy or two copies is twice as much of the effect as one copy. Well, that does not apply to these recessive or dominant things. Uh, so what we really, what we could view these as we need to predict the additive effect and we need to predict the dominance effect on things like fertility, calf livability, stillbirth. Uh, we don't have very easy methods yet to deliver the dominance solutions directly to the, to the producer. So we give them a list of all these you know, haplotype carriers, and then they have to remember when they're making a mating, oh, this one, you know, it's a carrier of this defect, so do not mate that female to the, the bull that carries that. that. That works. I'm not sure exactly what percentage of the population of, of the cows out there are being bred with mating programs. It used to be pretty high. Uh, I'm not familiar with the percentages. Yeah, I don't there are a lot of mating programs available with the tools to manage that. But so now these new ones that we're discovering uh, that are even partially penetrant, those, those it's it's uh, harder for to keep track, especially if we could discover many more with the dominance effects. Uh, it would be nice in the long term to come up with just uh, an adjustment to the to the uh, genetic evaluations to include the, both the additive effect and the dominant or recessive effects. We're not there yet, and so that's why we're hand delivering each <laughs> new defect on its own. Okay, do you have another question? I have a whole list of them. All right, next one on here is, how do they see gene editing playing an important role in the future? Are we going in this direction at least for undesirable genetic factors? Who wants to take that one? Hey, Matt? I mean, so ABS gene is, we, we do have gene editing. We're working on that in our pigs, the PIC. Um, I would say our viewpoint for a lot of these genetic defects is, Yes, we could use gene editing for it, but we have other tools that are much quicker and more efficient. You know, if we, once you've found the, you know, muscle weakness, JNS defect, if you wanted to gene edit that, by the time we would gene edit an embryo, make that individual, we would probably have faster genetic progress if we just use the defect status 
in our main decisions. Um, to the previous question, you know, we, we do internally kind of use the economic importance of the mm -hmm. defect. In-house indexes. In-house. And we look at the frequency of it and we look at the impact of it. You know, JNS. There's, you had the graphs showing up. You know, it was very high when it came out. We selected really hard against that because it was very frequent. Mule foot today, not really concerned about mule foot. It's still present in the national population, can, just can very, very low. Can trends on the screen? I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you're going to the frequency point, and we need to address that if we can. Perfect. Go ahead. Yeah, so if you, if you look at these um, you know, the trends, pretty much they go up and they start to go down because the cause of allele was found. So you look at that and say, what is your risk? Now, in your herd, maybe you have a genetic defect that is very high, so you want to select strongly against that. Maybe you're not concerned about one that you don't have. If I could say, hey, here's a great sire, sorry, he carries mule foot, you may not care about that because you don't have any carriers in your herd. So we do use the frequency of it and we do use the severity of it. I mean, it's muscle weakness. The calf dies in afterwards. That, that hits you hard. Pulsing haplotype, the abortion is aborted at two months of age. It's bad, but it's, you know, it's not as economically bad and it's not as uh, animal welfare horrible. So, so for the audience, I think we have, uh, I believe there's five breeds on the chart with multiple uh, conditions listed. And you can see in several cases, not all, but in several cases, uh, the frequency declines very quickly once our breeders know about the condition and have labeled uh, sires and if you test your females, they will be labeled as carriers are free. And uh, I think uh, that is a very, very powerful tool to manage from. So the encouragement is we see improvement. Uh, the frequencies going in the right direction in most cases, not absolutely all. Um, do you have another question from the audience? I do, yes. Um, so related to reporting, uh, who should, sorry, wrong one. Uh, what's the cost to a producer to sample and submit a research sample on a suspicious animal? Cost of a phone call? I mean, honestly, if it's one of our producers reported to us, we will send out the tissue sampling device. If it's we'll pay New Jersey, we'll help them test it. I think all the breed associations would. Yeah. All the breed associations, that, I'm that sure, CDCB, USA. I think that question from the farm level. Spencer, you want to? I, I'm a firm believer, and we need to report it. Us producers out there are the seed stock of information. And I think if you send it to any of your organizations, eventually, if they get one or two samples sitting on their desks, they're going to just kind of look at them for a while. But if we start reporting something and all of a sudden they see a pattern, I got a feeling they're going to invest some money in going forward and trying to figure out what's there or what, what does John Doe see up in Minnesota and also sees in California and we're also seeing it in another part of the world. So very simple to grab a tissue sample, put a number with it, identification number or a hair sample, whatever you're, you're doing on your dairy, at least report it bring it with to some of these events or send it off to your association of your breed and see what they do with it. If we don't report it, it doesn't get off the farm and it goes down the road with the rentering truck. I would, I would say that I, I'm confident most of the breed associations, I know with Jersey, you can uh, go into our website and click on abnormalities and find the reporting form necessary. Very simple to do. And I'm, I'm confident Holstein, likewise, hopefully the other breed associations, and likewise, as Matt has said, you know, our, our industry is also all about sustainability. And without full transparency, you know, our AI companies, they don't want to sell you something that you're going to regret later. And they're, they're in business to keep you in business because they want to stay in business. So 
I have one more question. How much time we got? You have about five minutes, and I have a Perfect. smart person clarification point here, if you're willing to take it. Okay. So, this is a little, little uh, touchy question. So, I'm addressing it to everybody who wants to say anything. In some herds, crossbreeding has become pretty popular. It appears that most of the, the identified undesirable conditions or factors are breed specific. There's some that overlap. Are breeders at risk or the breed itself at risk of introducing undesirable conditions from other breeds through crossbreeding? I know this is a touchy subject, but I, I, I would say high level, there is a possibility of doing that. And we have seen evidence that animals, not in the dairy industry necessarily, but in animals that were not available within the structured breeding programs became used in a different breed as a base to start some uh, interbreeding and things like that because the policies didn't maintain them as viable candidates within that seed stock population. So you, there is some risk of that happening. And that's where whenever we have broad based tools that help facilitate an awareness of what is the risk to the population, we try and give some summary information or things like that. And I'm sure CDCB would be tracking and aware of some of those kinds of things in, in certain cases. So there, I would say there is some risk and you have to think about is it seed stock? Is it commercial production? What's the viability and what's the risk to that population based on the policies and approach implemented? I would say I've seen this more in the, in the beef cattle side. The diseases we think are in one breed actually are in multiple breeds once you test enough animals. Also with your cross breeding, you know, remember if you're using say Holstein Jersey, Holstein Jersey, Holstein Jersey, you're still at risk. Your crossbred animal you know, could carry HH1. Well, the next time you use a Holstein sire, that crossbred animal is at risk of HH1. So, I'm hearing if my females are tested, AI companies are testing every bull they offer. We also have a multiple breed evaluation through CDCB. All good tools and methods, strategies. If we, uh, it sounds like if we utilize the tools and information that's available, that risk is, that potential risk is pretty low. Sounds like. Paul, you wanna? Well, I was, I was gonna give a counter example is that uh, the introgression of bringing in other DNA into a breed is, you know, generally frowned upon but at some point in the past, the uh, polled, which is another haplotype that we track, right. there were two different mutations long ago. They're both in jerseys, they're both in Holsteins. Uh, and I think, you know, and I would not be uh, uh, shocked if other breeds wanted to bring polled in, you know, the old fashioned way. Uh, is that they're doing that with the slick mutation right now, even in Holsteins. So there are other uh, things which one breed has, which the others don't, which may be worth transferring. You have a little bit of a risk of transferring something unexpected, but you have a very high benefit of transferring in the thing that you really want. That gets back to the gene editing. There's, you know, there's more than one way to, uh, <laughs> to move the uh, useful genes around and uh, we should use all the tools we have. And we have a lot of tools, a lot of information. So, excellent uh, response and, and explanation. We have another uh, audience question. Paul, would you uh, address the Holstein muscle weakness and the status of the investigation where that's at. 
All right, the, the status is that the muscle weakness was uh, discovered by breeder reports. It's not something we could have found very easily using our, our normal methods, both because of the incomplete penetrance and because it was a new mutation within an existing common normal haplotype. And so, because it had these two new features, uh, and because the common haplotype was very common, that sorting out the, the animals that have the new mutation is still difficult with just with a haplotype test and with pedigree. It's getting easier because Holstein Association uh, gathered up all the gene tests from the, from the companies and, bre and private breeders that were willing to send those in. And so we have those now. And uh, the current status is we, we, in cooperation with CDCB, have been testing a couple of new ways to use the information. And uh, we hoped we would have a, a formal decision of exactly what the best method is you know, before this meeting, uh, we have a couple of different options and we want to make sure to choose the better option first instead of releasing the information and then saying, oh, we, de <laughs> we decided to, to change it. Because there's going to be a lot of animals where the haplotype test uh, is just, the answer is we don't know because we can't tell whether the normal or the mutated version was inherited, especially for, for herds where you don't have good pedigree or you don't have the dam's genotype. And so we are close to making that decision and then it still has to go through the official channels to decide whether to release the haplotype, but uh, that's where we're at now. Thank you very much for that explanation. It, it sounds like we're close. Uh, just a little bit more work to do. I think we're at break time, and uh, I think uh, we're going to take a 15-minute break after uh, this session. So I want to thank our panel for excellent discussion, and, and uh, we sincerely appreciate you sharing your wisdom with us today and information. George chuckles as I said. <laughs> that was for you, George. <laughs> so. From me and on behalf of the CDCB and the industry, thank you so much for helping us today and, and uh, we appreciate it very much.